1918. For over 300 years, Cork Harbour had been a cornerstone of British defence in the Northern Atlantic, one of the most fortified harbours in the world, protected by a ring of stone forts and bomb-proof Martello towers. Since the outbreak of war with Germany in 1914, over 25,000 men and women from Cork had volunteered to serve in the armed forces. At least 4,000 of them died in the war. The munitions factory in Cork was the biggest employer of women in the city, while many more worked with the Royal Navy and Merchant Navy operating out of Queenstown, now Cove, in Cork Harbour. Cork's defences had been greatly strengthened. An anti-submarine net was strung across the harbour mouth. But German U-boats remained a constant danger. In 1915, the horror of the war ripped into County Cork when a torpedo sank the Lusitania off the old head of Kinsale. Nearly 1,200 people died in the attack. In 1917, the United States declared war on Germany and a squadron of American naval destroyers arrived in Cork Harbour. By 1918, there were 7,000 American personnel in the neighbourhood. They set up saloons in Cove and began inviting local women to dances, prompting the parish priest to warn against the danger of these thousands of vultures preying upon the purity of our daughters. Heartbreak Hill at Ahada is apparently named for all the girls who fell in love with Americans, only to watch them sail away. As 1918 got underway, Allied victory was by no means a sure thing. German U-boats were destroying vast amounts of merchant shipping. In response, Cork Harbour became a central assembly point for vessels sailing under the new convoy system by which merchant ships and troop ships sailed together, providing mutual protection against the enemy. However, the attacks continued and five cargo ships belonging to the City of Cork Steam Packet Company were lost to torpedoes in 1918, along with nearly 100 men. On the Western Front, Britain's need for more soldiers intensified when Russia's new Bolshevik government signed a peace treaty with Germany in March 1918, freeing up a million German stormtroopers to launch the Spring Offensive, a massive counterattack in which thousands of British and Irish soldiers were killed every week. As US President Woodrow Wilson declared, the Great War was fought for small nations. The eyes of the world had focused on Ireland during the Easter Rising of 1916, and while there had been no rebellion of note in Cork, the city was home to a powerful cast of strong-minded nationalists. Their disdain for the moderate tactics of old-school politicians like John Redmond seemed justified when, in the wake of Redmond's death, David Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, tried to force compulsory military service through as part of the deal for Irish home rule. The threat of military conscription united the disparate forces of Irish politics, nationalists, trade unions, suffragists, and most notably, the Roman Catholic clergy who organized a pledge against conscription said to have been signed by nearly two million people. While the Irish Labour Party declared a general strike, 100,000 Irish volunteers prepared for ruthless warfare. Lloyd George backed down, but his government then overplayed its hand again by arresting 150 leading Irish nationalists on the back of an alleged Sinn Féin plot to unite with Germany. As doubts mounted over the credibility of the so-called German plot, the incarcerated nationalists could derive some contentment from the growing support their cause was getting, not just in Ireland, but also in the USA. The approaching end of the war was complicated by other factors. The deadly Spanish flu pandemic, described as like fighting with a ghost, left over 23,000 dead across Ireland. Gone too over the course of the year were at least 650 men and women from Cork who lost their lives serving in the armed forces. On the 11th of November 1918, the war finally ended in Europe. 
As the monarchies fell in Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and elsewhere, it became clear that the tide was turning in favour of small nations. But for Irish Republicans, like Cork men Terence McSweeney and Michael Collins, the fight was not yet over. The general election in December was an extraordinary event, not just because it was the first time Irish women were allowed to vote, but because over two million people voted to give Sinn Féin 73 of the 105 seats available. All seven Cork seats were won by unopposed Sinn Féin candidates. Just over two and a half years after the Easter Rising, the objectives of those who wrote the Proclamation of Independence had been ratified by the Irish people. Despite the fact that most of its MPs were still in jail, Sinn Féin prepared to field its own government as 1919 got underway. However, London was not yet ready for an independent Ireland to arise from the ashes of the war. Soon the country at large was plunged into a bitterly contested war of independence. Cork City was destined to burn, but the fierce spirit of Irish liberty would ultimately triumph. <laughs>